getting here. Um, I think Josh Bodum, who is our uh, event organizer today, may have gotten stuck at lunch, as I'm sure some of our attendees have as well. <laughs> but I'm really excited to hear from Devo Dutta, who is um, one of our, oh, there you are. Hi. Well, I'm just going to present anyway. Um, <laughs> he's one of our core community members in Kuplo, and he works at Cisco. He is here not to talk about how Cisco handles machine learning, but instead um, how they've engaged with the Kuplo community and how they've helped us build the project what it is today. So thanks, Evo. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm sure um, after lunch, I'll, not, I'll try to not bombard you with too many slides and demos. Hello, can you hear me? I don't know how to post this, but uh, yeah. So um, I've been an engineer at Cisco. I'm originally from. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of years at Southern Cal, went to USC, and so today, what we are not going we are not going to talk about Cisco and what Cisco does with AI. But just wanted to let you know that we have a diverse portfolio of products, and all of these products use AI in some form or the other. We have our own scars and pain points of. Uh, you know, the AI ops, the data scientists, we have all of the above that we've talked about today. But we are not going to talk about the Cisco stuff. Uh, I just wanted to, and I'm sure there are many people over here who are in, uh, from uh, other enterprises, they are thinking about similar problems. So I just want to talk about why we chose Qflow and what was the rationale like exactly one year ago. So a year ago, when we were um, trying to build our own machine learning pipeline inside my team, we were trying to build a machine learning pipeline, and then we uh, noticed Qflow. I talked to Jeremy, and we said, okay, you know, why did, we went back to the team, and I said, we should actually just scan our own project and just contribute uh, um, and start building with the community. It might take a little longer time, or it may not even take a little longer time. We don't know. But when we saw the right kind of people in the community, so our, our metric was, who are the people in the community? We saw Canonical, Red Hat, Google. Um, they were all in the community. So I said, OK, that's a good community. It's going to start, and it's going to take off. So that's what we, and, and so right now, Qflow is our pure open source effort. We do not do anything internally. Everything is from day zero, external facing. And so that's why I just wanted to talk about how did we choose what to contribute in, um, and so that uh, many of you who will go back to your own enterprises can think about what your needs are and how you can help either uh, use Qflow or you can probably leverage Qflow and then contribute back to Qflow in many ways. So there are multiple ways you can. Uh, look at our journey and figure out what, what, what works best for you. So we saw, when we looked at all our products, and we talked to a lot of our customers, so I personally talked to a lot of our customers, everybody uh, has the same pain point. They are not uh, completely cloud-focused uh, or completely on-prem focused. In fact, they typically deploy their production workloads across multiple clouds, and they have all kinds of um, uh, you know, pipeline, I mean, the life cycle challenges, and, and uh, uh, you can recognize at least with most of them. So, so the biggest problem is that when you uh, try to manage the entire life cycle and you try to manage the cost of running the entire um, life cycle across many clouds, the different tool chains that different cloud providers have and the on premise software uh, has. Is, uh, I mean, it can be a bottleneck. So what we felt is Kubeflow is the right platform because directionally uh, it abstracts all the machine learning infrastructure from uh, the user end user, and we'll talk about. And you know, there are different personas, and that's when uh, you can make rapid progress. So if you want to accelerate your teams, your customers, your partners, whoever in machine learning, in the long run, it's not just about data science, it's not about DevOps, it's about the entire life cycle. Please do consider Qflow and contribute back. So there is one use case. When people say that, oh, but cloud provider X already has a cool ML tool, why can't you use this? Um, so if you look at some of these use cases in industrial 
uh, setting. Uh, let's look at simple things like microscopy, where you know you can go to openmicroscopy.org and get to know the entire use case without having to take notes. But there are, I mean, if you look at these high throughput imaging systems in industrial environments, they can generate um, you know 50 to 100 terabytes of data a day, depending on how many of those machines you're uh, leveraging at one point. So the question is, how do you determine artifacts? It's not about figuring out which uh, a cat versus a dog, which is you know the quintessential ML use case uh, that uh, that all to half of the talks have. It's about you know real um, industrial value. So, um, so in these use cases, you just cannot connect to the cloud at at that speed. So you would have to do both on premise and cloud, and you would have to think about think about always think about consistency not just how something works well for you today, but as you grow your businesses in, uh, and span across multiple clouds. So our, when we looked at our problems last year, uh, when we started off, we said that we are going to simplify our customer's journey by betting on open source, by looking at, product, uh, um, our, by looking at open source products that come from partners that are known to do good things in AI, and that can help both the two sides of the uh, organization. So typically in an organization, you have the, open, uh, you have the uh, scientists and the engineers and the IT, uh, for enterprise IT somewhere, trying to figure out both the sides of the same coin. Um, and so we bet on Kubeflow. So that's pretty much the motivation. And if you have a different motivation, would love to uh, uh, hear post the talk. But. So this is this is this slide deck is evolving, but um, this was something that we felt that Qflow is really good for the basic Q, uh, Kubernetes integration and the essential ML tools, because that's going to be commoditized. It's uh, it is best to pay your technical debt upfront. I mean, I'm just talking on behalf of any enterprise who wants to accelerate themselves in uh, machine learning and focus on your uh, line of business applications, which is the top layer of the stack. That's where you want to focus all your energy and let open source, uh, and, and let's build very strong, big open source communities to deal with the other layers. So this is a proof point that we've done. So our, so our goal is, uh, so from our team, our team's charter is make you flow really good, but ensure that you have a consistent experience whether you're in the cloud or you're not on the cloud. And we've kind of worked with uh, Google's partner engineering team on, on, uh, regularly to ensure that we have the uniform UX. For us, that is the most important thing, and we will keep highlighting that in the talk. So in order to uh, kind of get into the community, we, uh, we were new to the community, and we, we didn't know exactly what would be valuable, so we asked, Jeremy and uh, David, who's, I don't know if David is in the room, David Arinche. So we said, where can we help the community rather than what, pro uh, what can we, uh, you know, this is what we want to build. Um, so, so effectively we said, okay, let's see what an ML training job looks like. It looks like some kind of a, a Keras or TensorFlow workload, and then you have, go through the TensorFlow tool chain, you compile it, uh, and you, um, you know, through a tensor, through an operator in Kubeflow, you uh, run the job on Kubernetes pods. So this is like everybody in this room probably knows this already. So then, where do we contribute? I mean, so we realized that the TF operator was really well, um, robust and very good, but there was some gap in PyTorch, and we also noticed that uh, at that point, Kubeflow had a really good uh, project that was just kick, um, uh, kickstarting called CATEB. And so we were looking at all these things and we kind of took the uh, community guidance and we said we are going to first improve the PyTorch operator and make it as good as the TF operator. That's, so that's what we did. And um, uh, instead of, uh, sorry, uh, so, so and, and that was really good because we started seeing a lot of uh, teams who were not wanting to use Kubeflow because, oh, Kubeflow is only about TensorFlow. Then we said, no, Kubeflow is not about TensorFlow. It's about any kind of machine learning backend that you want to have. And so this was a, a good step in that direction. 
then when we started playing with Cube, uh, Kubeflow a year ago uh, on premise, uh, we said, how do we know this uh, stack is performant and, 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 and it matches up to our expectations? So we realized that there was a big gap at that point and the gap was benchmarking. If you want to have an on-prem solution, what is your benchmarking story? So we said we'll create a benchmarking uh, pipeline, I mean, an entire module for it. So we contributed that, and in fact, we, uh, we feel very good about it because, we, because not only did we, not only can we use that in Kubeflow, we can connect other open source communities together because if you, if you Google for mlperf.org, that's another benchmarking community that's, again, spun up by many companies. It's basically to come up with industry standard deep learning uh, benchmarks. So now we our goal is to ensure that we can run some of their reference workloads um, on a Kubebench, on a, on a Kubeflow cluster, no matter where it, it runs. And um, a, another thing that we, when we looked at Kubeflow, we realized, OK, Remember the slide that I showed you? So you have the basic uh, tools that integrate uh, machine learning workflows with operators into, um, into Kubernetes. But typically, most of the time, whenever you start uh, you know, ramping up your data science teams, most of the time, people will take existing models and fine tune them. I think this was also mentioned by the, the, the panelists from Wiser that many people do not have the skills or do not have the time or the resources to build a, a model from scratch. So hyperparameter tuning and, in, and looking at some of the advanced art like neural architecture search is actually very important. So for those who don't know hyperparameter tuning, a simple way to understand is, suppose you take a deep learning model, you specify the models, but you do not know how many layers to use, what kind of filters to use, what are the filter sizes in a typical CNN, and you want to iterate and uh, figure out what is the right uh, variant or the qualities of the right model that you want to train. This is not even like uh, figuring out what model to use. Like given a CNN, if you've decided you want to use computer vision and you want to use CNN, what are the qualities of the model? What kind of parameters would you train? So, so that is hyperparameter tuning. By the way, the hyperparameter is not the same as training the model. And if you want to take a step forward, on one hand, you have hyperparameter tuning. The other hand, you have neural architecture search, which means I don't know whether I want a CNN uh, model that's specified already in uh, you know, the, the TF examples. I want to start building my model from scratch. I may have some constraints. And that's when you actually build the architecture. And that, that field is called neural architecture search. It's, in the relatively a recent field, and there's a lot of activity in the industry. And what we, uh, when we saw uh, Catib, uh, the hyperparameter tuner, we said, why shouldn't it do neural architecture search? Because we were already independent of Kubeflow, doing our own research and putting out open source software to do this. We said we are going to make this happen inside Catib. That was our promise. I know Jeremy and I we've talked about this promise for many years, months now, not years. Sorry. Um, so by the way, one of the things that we did along the way was we also contributed the Bayesian optimization for CATEB. And right now, this is in alpha, but we are contributing all the neural architecture search stuff into CATEB so that CATEB becomes a general AutoML system. And then we can have, uh, then we will be much closer in terms of parity between the cloud, uh, to, um, uh, uh, the tools from the cloud providers and on-premise. And so these are some of the ways that I think the, your uh, um, companies, or if you're from academia, you can contribute and make this community a really robust community that, and make you flow, you know, the, the de facto ML platform for Kubernetes as opposed to building yet another one. Otherwise, you know, if uh, people will keep building uh, um, uh, tool chains, and that's probably not that valuable. And the bigger the community is, the more things that you can use, um, you are going to actually have a more vibrant ecosystem. And it's going to just amplify your effort. So one of the things that we also recently started participating in the community was uh, 
helping um, folks in actually uh, talking to customers and doing user surveys. So you've probably seen th this from Thea already, but essentially we realized that this community as it grows, the needs will change. So our goal was to see today, let's take a snapshot, let's help in the user survey. Let's actually do the user survey every six months to see the dynamic nature of the, our community and how it move, uh, changes and so that uh, we can build the right things. And essentially what we realized is when we, looked at, uh, we, when we talked to a lot of people, and it, even internally, a lot of people want uh, on-prem to be a first-class citizen. So that's why we, start, we, uh, we created a CUJ uh, proposal. And by the way, it's not a Cisco proposal. It's a community proposal. We expect everybody to contribute to it. Um, and we just, there was nothing in the community, so we just jump-started it. That how do we make uh, on-premise a, a first-class citizen? So for example, how do we, you know, the baby steps are how do we address bare metal installer management challenges, then how do we ensure uh, storage integration as the uh, Arecto talked about, and then how do we ensure the same user experience? I think that's very hard to define um, you know, very precisely because the community itself is changing and it will keep improving. But as the community evolves, how do we ensure seamless UX on, on premise and in the cloud? So, so I think, only when we, you have seamless UX can you have seamless hybrid cloud. If your if your on-premise UX sucks or it's not as good, you will not have the hybrid cloud um, experience. And that's what if that's what your business requires, you you need to enable that. So we've taken some baby steps. I don't want to go into the details, but most importantly, what we want you the community to do is to join hands and do a lot of testing, figure out what your use cases are, talk to the PM community, um, uh, give feedback to the on-premise uh, community. In fact, we want to create a subgroup so that we can actually help prioritize this. It's not going to happen just with one um, uh, you know, participant in the, in the room. It's going to happen when we all join hands to make this uh, on-premise uh, system look as good as the cloud uh, pro uh, offerings. And of, co of course, there's a lot of testing involved, there's a lot of integration involved, a lot of solutions uh, uh, need to be done, and a lot of good documentation that we need to do. So I think Kubeflow is a really good, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great journey, and we believe that we will keep uh, improving the community, we'll keep fueling the community, and I think it's going to take off. There is no doubt in our, in, in our minds it's just that we want more people to join it. And that's pretty much what my, uh, the reason why I'm here to talk to you about Kubeflow. So I didn't want to spend much time because everybody's just after lunch, but we still have six minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, critical user journey. Yes, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Any other question? Yes. Um, I think I asked this question in the previous talk, but I'm curious. Your use cases are very interesting. Uh, what about uh, non-deep learning uh, use cases? So, yeah, so that's a very good. So the same, I think we've all felt the same pain points. We have a lot more, and I mean, personally, when I look around and talk to um, our customers and partners, we have more non-deep learning workloads, and that's one of the things that we will also help so that's your points are really well taken um i have a question yes. for you I, it's a question slash and request for feedback what do you think are the most effective ways to engage with the cuplo community um as both like an advanced contributor and as a new contributor starting out so um, as an advanced contributor, the best thing is to actually attend the Kubeflow Contributor Summit and uh, just socialize and see where you can help. Um, I mean, go with an open mind. So that's the advanced contributor uh, pitch. For the new uh, contributor, I think the best way, so a lot of people within even my Cisco have said, hey, you're doing Kubeflow, I want to get involved. 
I would say install Kubeflow, run a simple application, and then you'll feel some of the pain points and start, uh, so start uh, attending the group meetings and actually just be on the Slack channel and ask questions. Ask a lot of questions and ensure that you can run Kubeflow first. Then you can contribute something to it. Thanks. What, what are some of the problems that you've seen running it on uh, bare metal, or, and what, what are you trying to fix? Yeah, so uh, if you think about Kubeflow uh, um, today, uh, the bare metal support for some of the components, like pipelines, and some of the uh, even operator support, you have to do some extra work. So for example, you have to do the storage integration. So it depends on how you're trying to use it, because pipelines works. but Pipelines is a very abstract view of your workload, but if your workload is somewhere else, you need to bring it close to you, and that's some of the. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so some mostly around. Actually, these are not major problems, but it's about making the UX better. They are like smaller, small issues. You have to fix your storage backend. You have to ensure things don't. Uh, you're, you're reading from the right place. So a lot of these things will be worked out. I'm sure the community is going to smoothen it out in the next few months. Um, so this network architecture search uh, in Kotib that you're uh, talking about, is that leveraging uh, any of the other existing open source uh, tools, like uh, Keras has AutoKeras, which does this? Or is it just like, a, you know, Separate effort. So I think it's been a it's been a separate effort from scratch in the Kubeflow community. In fact, uh, uh, what we've done is we built it in a pure. See, most of the other efforts they are they are not native Kubernetes efforts. So we wanted to uh, do it from scratch. So we had our own code base too for some of our own algorithms, and we've ported some of the existing algorithms uh, uh, into the framework. And so we wanted to be a native Kubeflow. Uh, Qflow tool. Yes. Not specific to this topic, but I have general question about the open source uh, of, of aspect of the Qflow. Uh, if you look at the current installation guide, you see it uses case on it, the KS interface. And but when I try to install, go to install KS, KS, yes, it is there. But I, I also see the note that it has been, dip, uh, it is. Defunct. I mean, it's, there is no more active deployment on that. So that's one question. Like, uh, are we going to update all our nodes to uh, uh, use? Uh, and so, I use the UI. UI work just fine, but uh, as I want to be more command line. No. So that's actually one of the things that the community is really working hard towards is to um, have better documentation and better. That's what we meant by better user experience. When a new user tries to learn and jumpstart, it's okay. still not. Uh, as friendly as it could be, especially for the non-ops folks, like the pure data scientist. I agree, and I'm happy that you already discovered that as a problem, so knowing that it is a problem is important. Yeah, we all okay. recognize, actually within the community we are very open and we recognize all okay. these problems and we are working very hard. Yeah, and the second part I wanted to ask is like, is, is there, what is the way to give feedback about uh, anything uh, so that, is I just Slack? Should Slack is, okay. uh, Slack works, and file an issue, if it's a real problem, file okay. an issue. It's more like a feedback, like what these kind of things, like user experience and all that. Yeah, I think Slack should be good. Okay, great. And, Thanks. And... Thanks. Um, I do want to emphasize that filing an issue is the easiest way to get your problems um, visible. And, um, and actually filing an issue and then referring to the issue from Slack or from the mailing list is like A plus contributor work. So please do that. So I have a silly question. Do you have any examples, maybe like some YouTube videos where you show working through an entire example, or do you have a, a GitHub thing or something like that? Yeah, so there are community examples, community GitHub stuff. We also have published on our uh, GitHub an entire example. Uh, so you can, but I would recommend uh, first check out the community examples. Yeah, you can find community examples in Kubeflow slash examples repo. Mm -hmm. Um, no, <laughs> we don't have, 
But, but yeah, just on GitHub, it's the best place to look at all of them, both coming from the Google team, but also from the community. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.